Taking Our Fate Into Our Hands, part two, where we have the opportunity to further this morning's stimulating discussions on concerning developments and growing challenges throughout Europe. Moderating this session is Ms. Courtney Cuby. Um, Ms. Courtney Cuby is an NBC national security and military reporter who regularly breaks exclusive reporting on the Trump administration. In just the last months, Cuby was the first to report on White House Chief of Staff John Kelly eroding morale in the West Wing, Chinese spying ahead of the Singapore summit, multiple details surrounding the Niger ambush, new CIA reporting concluding North Korea does not intend to denuclearize, and Russia jamming U.S. drones over Syria. For the past decade, QB was NBC News' Pentagon producer, covering wars in the Middle East and Libya, Syria, Afghanistan. She also reported from the U.S. military bases around the world. She's been embedded with troops from across all branches of the government and traveled alongside secretaries of defense, secretaries of state, vice presidents, and other senior U.S. military officials. Courtney joined NBC News in 2000, working in the Washington Bureau as a researcher, production assistant, and associate producer. She holds degrees in political science and psychology from the University of Michigan and resides in suburban Maryland with her husband and two twin boys. I will let Courtney introduce our wonderful and distinguished panelists joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wasn't expecting a long intro. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm also delighted to be here today uh, with what I think will be a very different look at Russia than what we've been having here at the, at the, the fascinating several days of uh, the Aspen Forum. Uh, we've heard a lot about the Russian relationship with the United States these past couple of days, but today, we're gonna, or right now, we're going to talk about how Russia is operating around the world and not specifically just the relationship with the U.S. These individuals and their nations um, have been uniquely impacted by the way Vladimir Putin is operating around the world. In fact, we were all meeting right before this and we called, we decided to nickname this the victim panel. Uh, <laughs> um, they have direct experience with Vladimir Putin's government and critical insight into what the US needs to know about him and the way that the Russian government operates. Uh, so uh, first we have at the far end, Andy Pike, who is the International Communications Director at 10 Downing Street and the former director of communication at GCHQ. Next to him, we have Vadim Chernish, who is the minister of temporarily occupied territories for Ukraine. And I'm going to give him a moment to explain what that is a little later. Uh, next, we have Bill Browder, who's financier and CEO of Hermitage Capital Management. <laughs> AKA Putin enemy number one. Uh, and then we have here Mick Marin, who's the Director General of the Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service. Welcome all. Thank you. Uh, I need to start with you, please, Bill Browder, um, <clears throat> because you were the subject this week of what President Trump called an incredible offer. Uh, in their Helsinki meeting, of course, everyone knows, President Trump and Pres President Putin spoke about the possible deal to allow Russian authorities to interrogate Americans in exchange for letting Robert Mueller sit on the questioning of 12 intelligence officers who were indicted for 2016 election uh, hacking. And after, of course, calling it an incredible offer, uh, the White House is now saying that President Trump disagrees with the proposal. Have you been contacted by anyone in the US government about this offer or about or any, anything in their discussions? Um, well, before I answer that question, let me just say that I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, six weeks ago, I was arrested in Madrid on a Russian Interpol arrest warrant. And uh, earlier this week, um, uh, Donald Trump thought for a few days about whether to hand me over to Vladimir Putin. And so I genuinely am delighted to be here. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I, so it, it, uh, on, on uh, Monday, I was not actually watching the press conference. Uh, I was um, just, uh, I was actually working on my second book, and I was hoping to have some peace of mind and peace of quiet to work on it, but my phone started vibrating violently um, and just bur started burning up, and then I looked on what it was, and I realized that I was the topic of uh, Putin and Trump's discussion. Um, <clears throat> and uh, everybody started calling in from everywhere in the world. Um, I got calls from, from Republican senators, um, from Democratic senators, from members of the House of Representatives, from think tanks from lawyers, but um, the, the one place I didn't get any calls from um, was the U.S. administration. Hmm. Do you, uh, and, and you've spoken out several times this week and said that you don't believe that President Trump is actually going to turn you over to the Russians. Is that still true? Well, so um, uh, 
I, I don't know what he's going to do. Um, but what I, what I can say is that um, I don't think that the American justice system would, would turn me over to the Russians. Uh, it's not as if the president, uh, I don't think that Donald Trump, whatever his intentions would be, um, could come around personally with handcuffs and cart me over to the Russian FSB in their embassy or to their plane. Um, what would happen is the, um, uh, uh, the Justice Department would have to get involved, and, and then they would have to look at the rule book and see whether the Russians' request satisfied the laws of the United States of America. And I don't believe they do. Um, and if they believe they did, then, th then they would um, do whatever they're going to do to me, and then it would be subject to the courts of the United States, which are entirely judges are independent here. And I'm 100% sure that, that no judge would hand me to my death um, in Russia. So I don't think that in the end I would go, I would go to Russia. However, having said that, um, I do believe that Vladimir Putin, when he comes back in the fall for his second summit, will make a second attempt to try to get Trump to hand me over. I'm, I'm almost certain that that's going to happen. So I'll put you on the spot. Do you think if, if he legally could do it, President Trump would hand you over to, to the Russians? Oh, you don't want to put me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have no idea. It looked like he was kind of thinking that that was an incredible idea. So, um, you know, it took three days to decide that it wasn't after a vote, after learning that there was going to be a, a unanimous vote of the Senate. So I don't know what his psychology is. Um, I, think he, I think that this, this would have been the straw that broke the camel's back on the Russian. Um, you know, a lot of people are uncertain. Is there collusion or is there not collusion? If Donald Trump would to turn over the largest um, Putin critic who had, hit, who had launched the Magnitsky Act in seven countries around the world to Putin for punishment, I think that that would have sent a pretty clear signal about where Donald Trump stood on the issue of Russia. Are you concerned that you could still be targeted, though, by the Russians? Is that, is that a, are you worried about your safety every day? Well, I've been targeted by the Russians for five years, so the, the, my, my problems with Vladimir Putin are not new. Um, his speaking out about me is not new. Um, the only thing new is the fact that, that he had this conversation in a highly um, visible format, which was in Helsinki. Um, the Russians have been chasing me for, for a long time, seven Interpol arrest warrants, 12 requests of the British government to hand me over and mutual legal assistance, numerous lawsuits around the world, six movies, six one-hour movies they've made about me on Russian propaganda movies about Russian TV. They're, they're, they're on my ass. Yeah. <laughs> you probably don't get any of the money off those movies either, do you? I don't think anyone makes yeah. any money off those movies. <laughs> Um, I want to move on to, to Andy, who uh, knows full well what it's like to have a, a citizen who's targeted by the Russian regime. The UK government has charged that Russia is behind at least one nerve gas attack in England. Uh, former Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia, who were poisoned in March, which was the first chemical attack in, in peacetime that we're aware of, correct? That's correct, yeah. So on the 4th of March this year, reports began coming into our emergency services of them. Um, two people who were profoundly ill in the beautiful uh, cathedral city of Salisbury. They were found on a park bench taken to hospital. I think assumed initially to be people suffering from um, overdose of regular drugs. Became very clear within 24 hours or so that this was not regular drug drugs and the, um, uh, the proximity actually of the hospital to our uh, research facility for uh, these weapons. Um, helped in this case because there were medical professionals who thought something was very odd. Uh, within a few days, we had identified that the uh, Russian-produced drug Novichok uh, had been used uh, on these two individuals. Uh, I think the uh, you know as soon as we focused down on what was happening, uh, memories of Mr. Litvinenko in 2006, the grim reality dawned that this was uh, a Rubon, Rubicon crossing moment in terms of our relationship with Russia. Nevertheless, unlike our uh, opponents in Russia, we followed due process and wanted to be very sure indeed. First concerns, of course, were for public safety, the um, mechanisms for handling major incidents in the UK cranked into life, and the COBRA mechanism was set up. Uh, when we were able, after about a week, to, to, to say uh, not just that it was Novichok, but to put the pieces together, and decided that the Russian state was highly likely responsible. We did that, and that set off a chain of events that we might come on to, but it did elicit the biggest response towards Russia um, in memory, uh, and the effect of that was that uh, 28 countries uh, expelled 153 uh, illegal or undisclosed uh, Russian intelligence officers. In the UK, we expelled 23 people, we think that just about cleans up their official operation there and will certainly do them damage for some years to come. 
uh, and we have entered a different phase uh, of our relationship with Russia, it is fair to say it has not been good for a while, but the audacity of this attack, the, um, the sheer recklessness of it, uh, is something which places us now into a different zip code in the way that we are handling our relations with Russia. And then, of course, since then, there's been a second person who was poisoned and, in fact, died from uh, the poisoning, which was uh, Don Sturgis. Can you tell us where there were some reports, I think it was yesterday, on C that there was CCTV video that may have showed the perpetrators. It was believed to be Russians. Where is that investigation, and is there a link? Have you drawn a direct link between the two attacks? So um, we are trying very hard to be evidence-based, and also it's quite hard for me to talk about investigatory detail but what I can say is, of course, um, we, we, don't, we are investigating at the moment where this, uh, second, how this second poisoning occurred. We do not believe that the second victims were connected to the Skripals in any way. Uh, as I say, we're following that evidential lead at the moment. We have not said that it is definitely the same um, batch of the drug as in the first attack, but that, of course, must be the key line of inquiry at the moment. I think what that does is it underlines the recklessness. Uh, we don't know exactly where it came from, but if you think about even the first attack, it was found on the, the door handle of the Scripples house, the biggest concentration of the drug. The drug, by the way, is so strong that it burns through regular hazmat gloves. Um, it um, was found there in high concentration, you know, the postman might have come along, for example, the next one, whatever quarrels uh, there were with the scripples and so on. So um, we are not easily shocked in the United Kingdom, but I must say we were rather shocked by the audacity of these crimes. Does the fact that they may not be related make it, turn this entire situation in, in a different dynamic? Does it mean that it has the potential for, some, for someone to weaponize this in a larger scale and attack larger populations? Is that anything that you're concerned about, or do you still believe that this is the Russians targeting individuals for the most part? It is too early to say, but it is likely that that, that is the scenario. I mean, we're not um, pursuing hard the possibility that this was a second targeted attack, for example, mm -hmm. but we are trying. I mean, the, the investigation is like three-dimensional chess, really. It's incredibly complex. One of the most complex things we've done in peacetime, I think, in our country, just on the second wave, we have 100 detectives working on that. The work to actually detect where the Novichok is, really hard with Litvinenko. You can buy a 50-pound Geiger counter and work out where the radiation is. This drug has to be tested. Our emergency responders who've been beyond magnificent because this is dangerous work, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, when they looked at the script holes in March, were able to do six hours in one, uh, in one go at searching these properties. But we've had warm weather in Britain, which is sort of quite, quite a, a, a shocking thing for <laughs> us, really. And uh, they, they've been, at one point, they were able to do 15 minutes only at a time because of the heat. Oh, wow. So the work has been painstaking, but we felt it was important to, to get it right rather than fast. But if it, if it turns out that the second attack against Don Sturgis is, in fact, the Russian state again, what does it say that they, they may have carried out yet another targeted attack despite this broad international community response after the one in March? Well... About deterrence. Does it say anything about the ability to actually deter Russia yeah. as, from doing as, this in the future? As I said, we are excluding nothing, but it looks unlikely at the moment that it was a targeted second attack more likely the byproduct of the first attack. But as I say, just want to stress that mm -hmm. the police are very keen that we are meticulous in keeping all lines open. What it does mean, of course, uh, if it is connected, is that a death of a British citizen will have occurred, um, and that, again, moves us into a different place, I think. It crosses a new international norm. Uh, we also have two people up here who are neighbors of Russia who know very well about Russia, um, their firsthand, their aggression. In 2014, Russia, of course, invaded part, part of eastern Ukraine. Uh, Vadim, can you start off just by telling us a little bit about the ministry, where you work, and, and your role there? Uh, the ministry was created by the government, and uh, no, I, I was elected by the parliament uh, approximately two years ago in order to formulate the governmental policy towards uh, our Ukrainian population who live within occupied territories, Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. But at the same time, we have a nationwide mandate on strategic issues uh, if they are related to IDPs, mm -hmm. internal displaced persons, and nation, nationwide mandate to coordinate all efforts to confront Russian non-military means uh, all around Ukraine in different areas. 
Uh, so uh, for, for, for the government, it's very crucial to understand that there are two domains when, when uh, Russia is operating, military and non-military, and we, we have been trying to coordinate non-military efforts to, to define our own gaps, cracks, tensions among Ukrainian society, not to allow Russians uh, to influence on the process and uh, uh, make uh, all our divisiveness uh, bigger. Uh, so for, for, for the time being, uh, uh, we have even some foreign advisors from UK, for example, mm -hmm. uh, from other uh, allies, and uh, uh, we have several strategic documents how, how to communicate with our uh, population, how to win their minds and hearts. You know this uh, very popular uh, phrase, but we have been trying to implement this and to put uh, this phrase into practice. Can you update us a little bit just on the military situation on the ground there? The, the gray zone is the area that sort of separates the two sides. Has the, the Ukrainian military been able to make any inroads? First of all, uh, this is not, uh, our conflict is not a frozen one. Uh, every day, uh, shelling, shooting, casualties, every day. And you know, Minsk agreements uh, limit some uh, using of uh, heavy weapons. And uh, a lot of snipers uh, around the contact line and counter snipers uh, were, uh, is in place. But very, very, very uh, important to understand that even two casualties, three casualties, several casualties per day, immediately amplified by media, especially Russian media, and even Ukrainian media within Ukraine, and no information about Russian casualties in Russian media. So if they use even this in order to destabilize, to traumatize Ukrainian society. So military and non-military, go uh, together in parallel in order to destabilize our country. And uh, the, the Russian general approach, not only using propaganda, first of all, uh, they, many years ago, they detected our so-called root causes. And, and for some politicians, even direct causes uh, more important. Then they, they, they use fertilizers, bribes, uh, for example, to corrupt some politicians, etc., etc., et et and propaganda. Uh, Russia is a doctrinal country, so they have a doctrine, mm -hmm. and they have a plan how to implement this. So th that's why they, they 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 try to use, and and in the end, they are trying to get a fragile situation in the country, and then the country could be an easy prey uh, for the military forces. Mm -hmm. So that's the Russian strategic and tactical approaches. Do you, have you seen any change now that the, the US relationship with Russia seems to be uh, confused? <laughs> and that, uh, while there's so much uncertainty about the US relationship with Russia, how is that, that impacting the potential that the Minsk agreement could actually be implemented? And we may see an end to this conflict. First of all, I took part in Minsk agreement more than one year ago, and uh, I participated uh, for approximately one year. It's not a strategic platform to, to find uh, any solutions because there is a Normandy format and there is a United Nations Security Council resolution and that means just a kind of implementing body uh, in order to put uh, some political solutions into practice. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, you ask, you know, a lot of Ukrainians I don't know how many of them, but more than I, I think more than 60, 65 percent believe that the only country that can help us is uh, the United States of America. Mm. So it's very popular, popular to think about the, uh, the United States as a country that can guarantee our safety and security in our country and confront with Russia. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, not how uh, all politicians understand in, in our country that Russia, uh, that the US is not going to use the, its military uh, forces to protect Ukraine, but at the same time, 
a lot of support to Ukrainian uh, to, to, to Ukrainian people uh, come uh, comes uh, through UN governmental agencies. Mm -hmm. and, and and by the way, we think about the United States as a kind of very powerful and country. I mean, Ukrainians think and and kind of a global security guarantor. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a lot of Ukrainians have been waiting for uh, such a support from the United States. Um, I want to move on to, to Mick. We're very fortunate to have Mick, who is the Director of National Intelligence for Estonia. Estonia, of course, who has focused on Russia for 25 years or so in intelli intelligence gathering. Uh, talk, can you talk to us a little bit about how you've seen the Russian strategic aims change in that time or in your time since you've been in the ministry? And then any new tools that they're using, you're seeing them use? Well, thank you. So I'm very proud to be the representative of the dark powers in the, in the panel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to be here because summertime anyway is, is a very bad um, season for old school spying. So uh, <laughs> I have nothing else to do anyway, so I'm glad to, to, to speak to you. <laughs> well, but I'm, I'm very proud to represent uh, Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service and, and our people who are the first line of defense of Estonia because when we um, do not succeed, I think... Uh, Estonia will have problems and, and the whole NATO will have problems. So we are the borderline between NATO and Estonia and it's also the border between NATO uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Russia. Well, stemming from the uh, geographical location you, you mentioned, uh, we haven't had any luxury to uh, change our focus during the last 25 or 26 years. Uh, I know that many Western intelligence organizations have uh, changed the focus to CT matters or to uh, um, things going on in, in the Middle East. For us, it has only been uh, Russia. So when uh, some intelligence organizations in the West are establishing or re-establishing uh, Russia mission centers, I would say that the Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service is a Russian Russia mission, mission center as, as such. And uh, just for your information, when we published one of our uh, public threat assessments uh, uh, a year ago, uh, Kremlin media made fun of us. They said that, well, in this report, it seems that Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service knows about the Kremlin's plans even before the Kremlin does. <laughs> well, it, is, it was meant to hurt us, but I think that it's the best compliment you can actually <laughs> receive from Kremlin. So now, we, right now, we are thinking about uh, actually making it an unofficial slogan of Estonian yeah. Foreign Intelligence Service. <laughs> Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service, a service that knows about Kremlin's plans before Kremlin does. They aren't denying it. Okay. They aren't denying the information. <laughs> but back to your question, uh, has anything changed or what, what is, what is uh, Russian goal? I think the goals have not changed too much, actually, when you, when you look back. Uh, because I think that the main goal for, for President Putin, for, for Russia, for the past few years has been to regain the superpower status to be equal among uh, the, the um, equals, to, to be back at the big boys' table, to be uh, a country that is respected. Of course, we have to know that uh, the economy of Russia is the size of the economy of Australia or the economy of, of uh, Spain. So, but, but still, the first goal to, is to restore the, the superpower status of the, of the country. Uh, secondly, what we see um, right now is the need and the will to break uh, Break, um, break out of the international isolation. Um, I think that um, they are exploiting every opportunity uh, to do that. And uh, the summit between President Trump and President Putin certainly was uh, one of his uh, goals, uh, seeing or uh, making problems uh, inside uh, different European countries uh, is also his aim because that makes us weaker. And when we are weaker, Russia is, 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 is stronger. Um, of course, one of the aims that Russia has always had is to maintain its um, influence uh, over the countries that are bordering Russia. I would actually exclude Baltic countries right now because I think Baltic countries for Russia are gone. We are members of NATO. We are members of, of EU. The NATO deterrence, I think, is, is working. But Russia is very concerned about other countries around the corner, uh, Belarusia, Moldova, Ukraine, um, Georgia. And they, can do, they will do everything they can in order to, to make those countries unstable and to uh, 
to meddle in, in the affairs of those countries' uh, international politics, and certainly when they would like to become members of the Western, Western community. Of course, um, in addition to the things I mentioned before, we, do, we shouldn't forget the uh, military power. Mm -hmm. Russia is very much focused on building up its forces, and especially in the Western military district that is bordering uh, uh, Estonia, Latvia. Um, we see new weapon systems uh, uh, employed, deployed to, to, to that region. We see annual large exercises uh, that practice war against NATO slash United States because the biggest enemy for Russia is, has always been United States or, or NATO. And the tools you mentioned, there are a number of tools. Um, I would say that the toolbox of, of Russia is, is huge. They have practiced how to use those tools for, for the last 20, 30, maybe even 100 years. Um, different tool, tools are designed to different countries. What might work in some country might, might not work in, in, uh, in another country. But the thing we have detected uh, during the last few years is the uh, use of influence agents. Mm -hmm. And when you ask me to define who are influence of agents, I would say that those are the people who use uh, their status and accesses in order to promote Russia's agenda with the direction of, of, of Kremlin. And we see, we have detected the network of uh, politicians, uh, journalists, diplomats, business people who are actually Russian influence agents and who are uh, doing what they are told to do um, uh, by Kremlin. And it seems to me that, it seems to us that Russia has invested a lot into those uh, influence agents. They have made some bad investments, but they have also made some very good investments. So politicians that have been in the margins of local politics some, some years ago are actually right now in uh, national parliaments or national governments. And we see clearly that those people are pushing uh, the Russia's agenda in those um, parliaments or governments. So these influence agents, these are people that Russia is recruiting, including politicians. Have you seen them recruit any Western politicians? Oh yeah, definitely. Anyone of course. you'd like to talk about here? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know that this is a very, very small and friendly forum, but I would not uh, <laughs> mention any names, but I would, I would just stress that uh, they have um, found people who have been or who were in the margins of, of the political life in, in, in different countries, in different countries in, in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, what they have provided to those people is media support, political support. They have proposed or um, uh, provided some um, exclusive business opportunities. And in some occasions, we have also seen that they have provided financial aid to those people. And then, suddenly, those people are in the positions who can actually uh, change or uh, they can try to change the political course of, of different countries. How do they recruit them? Do, is, there, is there a standard tactic? Is, is it a promise of money or a promise of helping them win an election? Or does, is it, do they use blackmail? No, it's, it's, a, it's a very practical way of doing things. Uh, when you are in the margins of, of the political life or, or, of a certain country, what you need, first of all, is, uh, is media attention, uh, the, the clips that you can use in your local um, uh, news channels. You need um, financial support um, and um, whatever a, a young politician needs. And that is not only promised, but that is also provided by Russia to those people. Hmm. And for that. When, you do, when we provide you these things, you have to provide us a few things when you get into the parliament or the local parliament or government. Wow. It is working in that sense. Um, you talked a little bit about influence operations. I, I want to open it up to all of you um, about Russia's cyber activities, which of course we've heard Dan Coates several times now in the last week talk about how Russia is the most aggressive actor in cyber. Um, and we saw in, uh, a, there was a DHS FBI report that was released in March that talked specifically about how Russian government hackers had infiltrated some critical infrastructure and that they had used malware that was sitting on uh, various US utilities, which was the same as what we saw in the Ukraine in 2015 and 2016 when they attacked your electrical grid. When, when we're talking about uh, Russian cyber attacks that could impact national security or could result in loss of life, critical infrastructure, should the, U the international community come together and call that an act of war? 
any of you? <laughs> well, I think that, uh, just to kick off the discussion, I think that in, in NATO forum, it has been discussed for, for many, many years. And uh, it seems to me that uh, in NATO, we have uh, decided that whatever um, is um, a problem to human life, it might come through kinetical attacks or from cyber attacks, it is a cause for Article 5, definitely. And I think that it's, there is no need to actually fine tune the Article 5 to include the cyber attack or whatever. I think it's a, the prerogative of NATO to decide which one of those attacks is an attack against uh, a nation state, be it cyber or something, uh, something else. But what we, what we have we've seen lately um, in cyber domain is that um, Russia is um, constantly scanning um, our networks. Mm -hmm. They're constantly scanning the, the, the software we are using in order to find out the, uh, the vulnerabilities of, of specific systems. And in case there is a need to, uh, to penetrate those systems, they are, ready to, they are ready to do that. And in addition to that, of course, they use um, the very traditional uh, cyber espionage. Mm -hmm. They steal emails, information from uh, different uh, networks, computers. They might not use that information immediately. Uh, that might be used in, um, in influence operations in, in the future, mm -hmm. maybe in five years' time, maybe in 10 years' time. Do you think that your nations are, are prepared for a, a, a cyber infrastructure, cyber attack by Russia? Do you have the defensive measures in place? Well, you can, you can never be prepared enough, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say that Russian attacks in cyberspace are nothing new. They have existed since cyberspace existed. We have been tracking these attacks for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I think certainly uh, in the modern age, they are probably the most, uh, one of the best equipped in the world, certainly one of the most aggressive. Uh, they do go after our critical national infrastructure. We have spent a lot of time, energy and money in recent years trying to protect ourselves as best we possibly can. So thankfully they've not had a uh, significant success. Uh, we uh, have invested several billion dollars in recent years in this area. We opened a one-stop shop a couple of years ago, the National Cyber Security Center, mm -hmm. which is part of GCHQ, and works, which works very closely with allies uh, around the world. And we found that to be pretty effective, but we're not sitting on our laurels. Um, this is going to be something that's going to preoccupy us. And we do need new mechanisms. We need even better sharing around our communities and new techniques. And we are looking right now at getting the technicals better, getting education better. And it will continue to be a focus for us, certainly for uh, the foreseeable future. U Ukraine uh, has been working with our Western allies in order to build a very good system to protect critical infrastructure from uh, Russians, mostly Russian attacks. But at the same time, we need more equipment, trainings for our personnel. And recently, Verkhom Narada, I mean, our Ukrainian parliament, uh, uh, adopted a new legislation on cybersecurity and uh, on national security. Uh, and two laws uh, were elaborated uh, in close cooperation with, uh, with uh, specialists uh, from the United States, from the Uni United Kingdom, and from even Estonia. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I may, a couple of remarks about Russian activities uh, uh, in economic area. They use oligarchs mm -hmm. widely. And even in, 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 in the United States, you know, one of them was questioned by, by special authorities. They use them not, not, not in, 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 so very easy for them, because all of them have legal business entity to enter into your economy uh, in different sectors and then to influence on the situation use, using legally uh, their business entity as a front entity for, for their malicious activity in the country. Uh, of course, U Ukraine has a border with Russia and much easier for them to penetrate into Ukraine, but they have uh, already reached the United States from my opinion. And about the border between Russia and the West, they haven't been trying to build a blank wall. Mm -hmm. This is more sort of a membrane. Russian influence penetrates easily through this membrane, but Western democracy cannot penetrate with its values into Russian society. 
Even VPN services are prohibited in Russia. So can you imagine way the arena of confrontation in Ukraine, in Western countries, in, U in the United States, but not in Russia? So this is, uh, from my point of view, uh, Russian strategy to bring instability in other countries and to protect, to build the, this kind of membrane and not to allow to penetrate into a Russian society with democratic values. I just wanted to say one thing, which is that um, the, um, the size of the Russian military budget is 90% uh, less than the US. So it's about 10% of the US military budget. And of the Russian military budget, I would estimate that 80% of it gets stolen. Um, and, and so if, if, you, and, and if you take the Russian military budget and you put it on par, it's about equivalent to the UK military budget or the French or the German military budget. And so Vladimir Putin um, is quite clear and quite and knows for sure that he would not win a military conflict with NATO, the West, even with one, even one member, uh, of, a big member of the European Union. And so his only um, tactic to get a seat at the top table and to be, a, um, to be a, an important player um, is to do these things where it doesn't trigger Article 5 of NATO, where there's plausible deniability. And so it comes to all, this, all these things that these gentlemen have been talking about, which is um, it doesn't cost very much to bribe a politician. And um, I, I, since I'm in the world of fighting Putin, I see how it operates. And they basically just make offers to everybody. And like, depending on the country and depending on how corrupt the country is, um, you know, in some countries, nobody will take the offer. And in other countries, many people will take the offer. Um, there is one member of the US Congress who, who I believe is on the payroll of Russia. He's a Republican uh, congressman from Orange County named Dana Rohrbacher, who is running around um, trying to um, overturn the Magnitsky Act on behalf of Natalia Veselnitskaya, who is the person who went to Trump Tower. Um, there are the oligarchs who are um, active in all the countries, um, per per penetrating and, and uh, permeating and doing things on behalf of the Kremlin. They're not, age, they're not FSB or KGB agents. They're oligarchs who are being asked to do stuff. It's all very informal. Um, and then, of course, there's the cyber. And the cyber is the greatest stuff for Putin because it's always plausibly deniable. They can um, do it and say, it wasn't us. Um, uh, it wasn't us. And, and how do you trigger Article 5 when some people, and, and then when you try to trigger Article 5, they're the guys who are already paid inside all of these parliaments all over Europe who are saying, no, no, we, we must get along with Russia. This is an important country, et cetera, et cetera. And so Putin is, is playing a very, a very clever psychological game as a, with a very weak hand and getting away with it in a very uh, successful way. So I just have to address what you just said because it's a pretty strong charge to say that Congressman Rohrbacher is an agent of the Russian government. Can you? I, I didn't say he was an agent it, of the Russian government. I believe that, that I, believe, I believe he's under some type of influence of the Russian government. What, do you have any evidence of that? Or is, or is well, his conduct. So um, he he has been. Uh, so uh, he went to Moscow. Uh, uh, Dana Rohrbacher went to Moscow, and um, uh, while he was in Moscow on a congressional delegation, he sat down um, uh, with a number of, of uh, members of parliament. They said, "Can you have a? Uh, can you come away from from this group and have a meeting with a person um, from the prosecutor's office?" And, um, and the person that, that, that uh, Dana Rohrbacher met um, is the deputy general prosecutor of Russia, a guy named Victor Green. And Mr. Green happened to be the person who is most intimately involved in, in the Magnitsky case and is on the US sanctions list. And uh, he met with this Mr. Green. And Mr. Green then gave him a bunch of documents to take back to Washington to try to stop the, Magnits the global Magnitsky Act from going through Congress. And so then Mr. Dana Rohrbacher went and, and for a brief period of time, stopped the law from going through Congress. We then discovered it. We outed him. Um, the rest of his congressional colleagues didn't want to be involved with this Putin's favorite congressman. And um, they put it through. He then tried to take Sergei Magnitsky's name off of the law that was going through. Um, there was a vote. He, it was, uh, I think, at the Foreign, uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee. And it was like uh, something like 40 to 1 um, against him. Um, and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. He was also entertaining. Uh, Natalia Veselnitskaya at various occasions. She's the one at Trump Tower. And so um, why does a person behave this way? Um, is it because he, in his heart that he thinks that's the right thing to do? I don't believe so. So, so basically you're saying you have a lot of what is, seems to be somewhat anecdotal evidence, but not necessarily. I, I, don't, I don't have the bank transfers to prove it, but I believe that that's the case. Okay. Um, have you, have you ever been targeted specifically by the Russian government in cyber? Do they, are they, have they, you been a target of their disinformation campaigns on, 
online? Anything you can talk about? Yeah, so, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of the, like the perfect case study in all bad actions of Russia, because every single bad thing they've ever done, they've done it to me. Um, uh, so uh, uh, propaganda, um, uh, they've made six, six one-hour movies in Russian, one movie in English. Um, they, tried, they tried to make a movie in English. Um, I, I, I hope that some of you know the Magnitsky story. Sergei Magnitsky was my lawyer who was murdered in a Russian jail cell for uncovering a massive government corruption scheme. And the Russians hired a, a, a filmmaker to make a movie to say that Sergei Magnitsky wasn't murdered, he died of natural causes, he wasn't a whistleblower, he was a criminal, and that I, had, I was in contempt of Congress for getting the Magnitsky Act passed. And they tried to get this movie shown um, at the European Parliament and on various European TV stations. I protested very violently. And um, they ended up showing it in Washington. And it was actually shown in Washington one day after the Trump Tower meeting, which Natalia, Natalia Veselnitskaya was was sponsoring the uh, event, and then well, uh, 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 the day after her, her meeting with Donald Trump Jr., um, with Dana Rohrbacher's staff organizing the, the showing. Um, I want to open up uh, to the audience for a couple of questions. Um, Kim Dozier, since you're sitting way up front, get the first question. So as promised, Courtney had me watching the wires to see what was happening. Um, so Kim Dozier from the Daily Beast. So while we've been sitting here, a couple things happened. The Russian ambassador today said that a Ukrainian referendum came up in the conversation with Vladimir Putin. The White House has since said they don't support such a referendum. And then right afterwards, the Pentagon came out announcing an additional 200 million in uh, aid to Ukraine, security cooperation funds for additional training, equipment, et cetera. So my first question is to Vadim. How does it feel hearing some things from the US president, but other things from his national security team? Who do you trust? And also, I can add that, ask that to everybody else. We use your intelligence reports, public parts of it, in Ukraine as well. Uh, we believe in information. Uh, that your intelligence, intelligence agencies put in the, those reports. But at the same time, about referendum, it is unacceptable for Ukraine. Uh, it contradicts Minsk agreement. Uh, I can tell you from my point of view, Mr. Putin does this in order to, you know this Hiroshima doctrine, the ratio military and non-military means like uh, four uh, to one, four non-military means and methods. Uh, destruction of allies is a part of uh, this doctrine, essential part of this. So if you tell someone uh, secretly, uh, I offer you a referendum uh, and tell someone else, uh, I offer you another type of solutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No common ground for discussion at the same table. So the, the real goal of uh, Russia, and in, in this from my point of view, is to uh, cause a mess among, among uh, all stakeholders, giving different information and different ideas. Uh, and at the same time, time is going on. And the state building process supported by Russia is going on as well. So that's, that's my answer about the reason of uh, such actions from uh, a Russian president. But at the same time, Ukraine is an independent state. And we will decide about referendum as a state, not anyone else. Thank you, Courtney. <clears throat> Emma Tivis in German TV. Just to illustrate what Bill and Mick said, I want to add that our investigation into the German AFD, uh, we found that uh, there have been many members of the leading circle of the AFD invited, been invited to Moscow, and uh, some of the flights have been paid for by Russian, Russian businessmen, which illustrate how that works, that oligarchs are paying to, uh, to groom uh, politicians in Europe 
And the other thing is um, that in Germany, for example, an oligarch set up a little company that a uh, media outlet that was starting to put out fake news propaganda targeting the Russian German population within Germany uh, in order to manipulate their, their opinions. So th those are the kinds of things I think Mick and Bill were referring to. And I was wondering, John, uh, this is a question to you. Um, is there any indication or could you imagine that the Skripal operation was meant to be a distraction from other things that the Russians were doing, including a huge influence operation in order to uh, support the Brexit referendum and funneling millions of dollars or euros into the campaigns for Brexit, as for example, the Legatus Foundation did. Well, um, you're doing the Russians' job for them there in that last question, because that actually was one of the narratives that they propagated. So. Um, very interesting case study in how a uh, textbook case study in how Russia chooses to fight these things. So very soon after the uh, Skripal poisonings, some narratives started to emerge. So in that first phase, we counted 25 that we could um, attribute to the Kremlin or its acolytes or to the state, uh, possibly up to 38. Um, there were, uh, uh, you know, they, they were sort of from the outlandish to, to, to the plausible. They pointed fingers at other countries, Sweden, Ukraine, and so on. Um, my personal favourite was that we, uh, we in Britain have a long history of poisoning Russians because we, um, we poisoned a Russian czar 400 years ago and we managed to inveigle uh, our British doctors in to f filling full of mercury. Ivan the Terrible. Um, and further, there was another clue because we keep doing these things in March and it was no, uh, you know, it was no accident that Scripple. The other, the other one was that um, Yulia Scripple was targeted because her mother-in-law to, to be didn't like her. Yeah. So we have not. Um, the, the Russians initially were using sarcasm and humour, and we've stayed away from that, from the gravity. But I can't um, resist pointing to the wag who said, "Well." If your mother-in-law's got access to industrial-grade nerve agent, <laughs> you might want to go back to Tinder or Tinderski or whatever you have in, <laughs> in Russia. <laughs> the old mother-in-law defense. I, I got the feeling that you might have gotten me wrong. I'm not suggesting that Britain was behind that operation. I'm suggesting that Russia resorted to old types, old methods, uh, to, to create all the fuss about the Skripal thing, to, that all the attention was focused on this and was taken away from other huge Russian influence operation uh, happening across Europe. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've never heard that um, theory seriously uh, explored. Um, the answer is we probably will never know for absolute sure the reasons for it, but the reasons are probably much uh, simpler and more straightforward than that. Uh, Putin himself has come out and talked about the fate of some people in um, Mr. Scripple's position. Of course, this crossed another Rubicon because it hasn't been done in the circumstances where Mr. Scripple had been pardoned uh, and all the rest of it. So the truth is probably probably simpler. Um, there has been speculation in the media that it was it was done to send a message. I've heard a theory that it was done because precisely because he wasn't you know extremely senior. To send a message that look you know we we will get you. Uh, Litvinenko, of course, uh, s s same thing. I mean, his, his death and so on. There was a theory that that was also uh, a message. And of course, we have seen Russia weaponizing dis disinformation for all intents and purposes, yeah. even as recently as this week with Macedonia yeah. and Greece. And, and I would ju just add, Court, just on that, on the so the narratives actually, you know, the way that we came back at those, we found actually that sunlight is a very good disinfectant. So we didn't get drawn onto every provocation, huh. but where these things were starting to get traction. We went out and told the truth. An example was um, the Port and Dome facility where we do uh, our research in this area. Russians took an overhead picture saying it was a new facility. I called up the head of that facility. He said, you know, that's for um, actually for explosive testing. We submitted the plans to the local council uh, a week ago. You can come and you can see them. So we, we had media in there uh, and, uh, uh, and did that. So we found actually sticking to the truth. Although the asymmetry that was mentioned earlier, the Russians are not in the main uh, obliged to uh, stick to the rules that we do. Rules-based order is what this is all about for us and why we intend to continue to show leadership in this area, because we're really worried about it. So the truth in terms of responses worked quite well.
The truth and transparency, yes. Vadim, did you have po uh, About poisoning, it might be considered as a kind of mafia style message to its member. Don't talk yeah. and don't do anything wrong. And uh, you mentioned uh, a situation in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. Again, a Russian oligarch was engaged in, 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 in the process mm -hmm. uh, in accordance with the UN, uh, official statement of Macedonian prime minister. So again, the same approach all around the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hi, Rick Reese. Um, this question may be a little bit off, but I'd just start by saying to Mr. Browder that your book, Red Notice, is probably one of the best books on value investing I've ever read. <laughs> and, um, and my question really goes to you on that. What, what, what are your thoughts today about others investing in Russia? And two, have recent activities on the part of Mr. Putin driven, uh, do you think they're driven or in the process of driving people to rethink that that as to whether there's any credibility and you know underlying the financial statements of Russian companies. <clears throat> well, um, so I'm, I, I used to be the largest foreign investor in Russia, and I would not invest a penny of my own money in Russia today. Um, the, the the problem with Russia is that um, the level of risk is so high that you not only risk losing your money, but if you have any significant investment, you also risk having people arrested, tortured, and killed, as my own story plays out so clearly. Um, uh, the amount of foreign direct investment in Russia since um, the invasion of Crimea has dropped by more than 95 percent. People basically nobody do, nobody who nobody who has people sometimes buy a Russian bond or they might buy shares of a Russian company to speculate on some movement up or down. But um, anybody who has assets in Russia wishes they didn't have any assets in Russia, and no, nobody is committing any new money to Russia because it's a highly unstable place where there's no rule of law and no property rights, and so. Um, I mean, I, and I, get to, I, I have this really uh, uh, clear inside view of all the victims, because most people in, in corporations don't want to go to the front pages of the newspaper to talk about their, how they've been victimized, but everybody needs some advice, and so they all come to me. And I hear, there, there, I don't think there is a single happy story of like being a, a serious investor in Russia. Everybody gets ripped off, everybody gets shaken down, and, and a lot of people end up getting criminalized, basically, in order to try to solve their problems they, they make these compromises that people would not normally make in the West until you end up, um, uh, some people pay, pay end up paying bribes or, or, or extortion money and then end up breaking the laws of the United States or the United Kingdom or other places in terms of foreign corrupt practices. And so my advice to everybody here is if you have any feeling about investing in Russia, uh, lie down for 15 minutes and wait till it passes. <laughs> <laughs> There is a, a lot for sale, actually, in Aspen that was $27 million. So if you have any money that you want to invest, <laughs> I highly recommend it. Ah, uh, sir. Thank you. Uh, Steve Shapiro from New York. Just as a point of information, and this is, I think this is still the law, and you gentlemen would know a lot better, but in 2006, and I'm reading from a BBC uh, piece of paper here so I could refresh my memory, the up, in July, the upper chamber of the Russian parliament approved a law which permits the Russian president to use the country's armed forces and special services outside Russia's borders to combat terrorism and extremes, extremism through assassination. Um, uh, and um, that terrorists or extremists were included uh, in the definition of them. They were included uh, those who slander the individual occupying the post of president of the Russian Federation. There are some technicalities. The president has to inform the parliament that he uh, ordered the killing, et cetera, et cetera. But apparently, it is quite legal under Russian domestic law to assassinate someone abroad uh, who slanders the Russian president. And if uh, I just thought that would be an interesting piece of information. Are you? Uh, are any of you aware of that? And, of and are, are, is the is the international community doing enough to protect against? Who cares about Russian domestic law? We we should think about international humanitarian law as well. And Russia, Russia breaches it every day. I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware. I'm just saying that it's a remarkable thing to have a law in the books of a nation which allows the assassination abroad of someone who slanders your president. That's all. Do you think, is, are, are your nations, is the international community doing enough to protect defectors or you know, people like Mr. Browder here who are speaking out against the Russian government? 
all judicial, international judicial mechanisms for the time being are not very efficient. And we should uh, think, rethink the system, <laughs> how to bring some, some people to the justice. I would just add that this um, situation in, in Salisbury definitely sparked uh, many discussions in, 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 in many countries and in many intelligence services as well, how to protect your, uh, your sources. But I would like to emphasize that it was a signal, a uh, signal to possible people who might be, who might start cooperating with uh, Western countries. And it was also a deterrence signal to, to Western countries. So don't even try to uh, hire more oppression people in order to inform you. So that was a, a messaging, but probably op an operation that went uh, truly out of hands. Probably someone was too eager to uh, implement the order that was given maybe many years ago. Uh, but still, it was a messaging thing as well. I want to take, we only have a couple minutes left, so I just want to ask the whole panel here. Russia has tended to target inflection points uh, on their disinformation campaigns, like the 2016 election in the United States, elections in Western Europe. What do you see or what do you fear is the next inflection point that Russia could target, whether it be in your own individual nations or in the world? Let me just say something, that there is no inflection points. Vladimir Putin is, is, uh, has an unlimited budget for this type of stuff. And he applies, and he basically, they run about 1,000 different projects at any one time, expecting that um, 990 of them don't bear fruit. And um, they're, none of them are very expensive. Nobody gets in trouble for wasting money. And every once in a while, one of these things um, hits, hits pay dirt. And they hit pay dirt pretty well in the United States. They hit pay dirt with Brexit and all sorts of other places. But for every one that you know about, there's like 50 other ones that they've tried that haven't succeeded. And they're just rolling this stuff out every day, all over the place, all the time. So they're in just a constant state of continuous attack. Ex exactly, and, and plausibly deniable attack. I, I totally agree. I think that they are looking for every opportunity that might arise, be it uh, in the margins of uh, elections or um, uh, some other possibility to create frictions inside the countries or uh, between countries. But uh, the term we use in Estonian intelligence community is that I think that we, we shouldn't continue practicing figure skating when the opposite team is already playing hockey. So I think, that, <laughs> I think that the Western community should actually put our heads together and, and do everything we can in order to, to stop it. I think that uh, we need to, uh, uh, to educate our, our people that Russia is doing these kinds of things. I think that we need to expose Russian activities because as, as my British colleague said, uh, sun is the best disinfect in case we talk about these cases, in, in case we, we show that Russia is doing this or that, I think that we would be in a much better situation uh, a, a year or two from, from now. I think, I think we need to cooperate more. I think there is a, a space for Western intelligence communities, uh, agencies to, to share more information and share it more quickly. And uh, last but not least, I think that we need to also concentrate on um, um, military signals. I think that we have to think about deterrence, whether deterrence works in NATO or not. And that's why it's uh, so important to have allied forces in, in, in different regions in, in NATO to send, send that very strong message to, to Russia. Do you think NATO is doing that right now, sending a strong message to NATO, to Russia? I think that NATO is, is doing that. Uh, we have European Deterrence uh, Initiative that was actually a US initiative. Uh, US administration is, is backing that initiative. We have funding, um, so everything is pretty well on track. Andy and um, Well, I'd just say I would agree with those analyses, although um, we are talking about inflection points. Of course, we're not over the present one yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the middle of it in some ways, so we are prepared for all eventualities, including escalation from the Russian authorities, which we uh, think is a pretty fair bet uh, now that the World Cup is out of the way. So we are trying to maintain readiness on all fronts. Do you, when there are major events like the World Cup, do you see any difference in Russia's activities in the cyber domain? Um, we don't see a halting of activity, that's for sure. They don't, they um, don't do anything that they, that when they have a, additional attention on them, they don't? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably not a very scientific measure, but when the Amesbury poisonings happened, 
which I stress we haven't yet attributed, but we saw an uptick then in activity again. I think it was a 4,000% increase in bot activity around the first one, but I talked about 25 narratives. So on Amesbury, there have been 12 so far. Hmm. So it feels as though it's been sort of less um, strong, the response, but nevertheless, plenty of response. Well, I have an example about military activity, and, and uh, a Ukrainian colleague can support me or deny it, but we saw uh, very um, interesting signals before uh, Russian presidential elections, there was a, a, a very um, low intensity in, in eastern Ukraine, and it went straight up after the uh, re-election of President Putin. And the same happened during the World Cup. Now it's going up again, I think. Huh. We'll have three elections next year, presidential, parliamentarian, and local. We expect a lot of Russian active measures in, in our country. And I, give you, uh, I want to give you one example about Russian sophisticated software technologies. They use for or send their own software. Uh, one uh, title, Katyusha, as a weapon uh, from World War II. Mm -hmm. and, and Russian civilian authorities you, you use it, not only intelligence. So they detect and they train within their own country and then spread spread it uh, all over the world. Um, I want to thank you all, and especially because we sprang this panel on them sort of at the last minute, and they were all very good sports to come up here today. Uh, if we give a round of applause. <laughs>